Good evening, everyone. How are you all? Welcome to First Aid AMC Clinical Physical Examination Course. Now, I know that most of you are already our running batch students. Some of you are here just for physical examination free session. And some of you are only our physical examination course students. So whatever is your status, that's fine. We are going to start our physical examination for, from, from today's class. Now, those of you already know about our physical examination class that we take at least a one month physical examination class and that runs every Saturday and Wednesday, exactly is the same time like today. So this is a very, very well, well prepared physical examination class almost every physical examination cases that, that is important for your exam, we try to discuss in these eight classes. So mainly we are going to focus on the basic of physical examination and we are going to do a couple of physical examination tonight. And from then, from next class, we'll be full on. All right. Now I can see that some of you are in Facebook. And if somehow this Zoom meeting has become oversaturated, then yes, you can always ask your other study partners or anyone just to be on the Facebook. That's also, also you'll be able to see this class in that way. All right, so let's start then. So what are the first thing that you should remember about physical examination? The first thing about physical exam is that you need to first understand that what is your mode of the exam? Are you going for face-to-face -face exam or are you going for online exam? Now, you, you are aware of the fact that nowadays the online examination is like it's, it's very hard to get into and mainly AMC is trying, trying to fool the face-to-face -face one first, and then if, if possible, they just add maybe two or three online examination every month. So it is not very easy to find. And those of you who are in Australia, most, most likely that AMC will not allow you for, a, for an online exam. So you should be aware of that fact that this is changing. Previously in the last year, online exam was the only mode of, mode of exam. In that case, we, we discussed a lot about online exam, how to do physical examination as an online format. But now the, now the trend has been changed and it's still changing. Now it's mainly we should focus on the face-to-face -face physical examination, but we will also do a little bit about the online exam as well. Now online exam, we have almost every notes that you need to prepare. So, if you are in the course, you will not need to worry about online examination, physical exam at all, because it's, it's already prepared. It is everything that you need. You need to just remember all of the things that we are going to say to you. About face-to-face -face physical exam, there are a there are lot of important things that you need to remember. First thing is practice. You will have to practice it without practicing physical examination on a person or even on a doll, maybe some dummy, you have to do it on, on something. Otherwise, if you, just, if you just memorize things or if you just, just read how to do a physical exam, that's never going to work in face-to-face. -face. So if you are going for face-to-face -face exam, make sure every day you keep at least one to two hours just for doing physical examination on someone. Beginners or even people who appear exam multiple times, most of them fail the physical examination. If you've passed these three or four physical exam in your, in your AMC clinical examination, there is a high chance that you will pass the full exam. So you should focus on this thing really, really like as much as you can, as hard as you can. So, you should spend a lot of time on physical examination. So I can't say enough how important it is for, for clinical examination, okay? 
Now, let's start with the basics of physical examination. The basics are always same, whatever is the mood of exam. So you'll have to be very gentle with the patient, especially for face-to-face -face exam, you will have to be double gentle. Take permission for everything. Now, in your country, you might be, like it's very really common to touch your patient without even asking for a permission. But in Australia, you can't do that. If you touch someone, even if it's like you are a male doctor and you are touching a male patient without asking for a permission, that is really, really rude. And also it's, it's not polite thing to do in here. So that's very important to remember, whatever you are doing, you should always take permission. It's not just taking permission at the, at the beginning of your examination, it's about taking permission almost every time you are touching the patient. You should always say, now I'm going to, now, now I'm going to touch your knee to do this examination. Now I'm going to feel your abdomen to, to see if there is any soreness in your tummy. So you'll have to take that permission every time. The next step is make sure you explain what you are doing at every step of your physical exam. So you are not going to just touch the patient's knee without saying why you are touching it. So we will say that now we are going to feel your tummy to check, the, to check, for, to check for any soreness in your tummy. So that's the reason. So you explain what you are doing. You explain why are you doing it. The next thing is making sure that there is a chaperone available in that case. Now, there are some of the private part examination in which chaperone is must. What are those? Especially if you have got a breast examination, if you have got a pelvic examination, or maybe taking a pap smear, if you have got a scrotal examination, if you have got a parrectal examination. So whatever you have got, which involves your private part, you should make sure there is another nursing staff available with you during the examination. And that is one of the key staves in those physical exams. Making sure that you always wash, wash your hands. Now you can ask me that how to wash my hands in an online exam. You don't need to do that, but you'll have to say that we are going to, I'm going to wash my hands and then I'm going to start my exam. So wash your hands before your physical examination and after finishing your physical examination, that is must. Especially in this COVID era, you can't miss this part. And then there is running commentary. Now, running commentary is important, especially for face-to-face. Face-to-face physical examination means that you, you do an exam on a patient, and then you give a running commentary to the examiner. So how it happens, actually, so let's say that you're doing knee inspection on a patient or maybe you are doing an abdominal inspection on a patient. So what you will do in face-to-face -face exam, you will stand beside the patient's bed, and then you will be looking at the knee joint, right? So you, and then you, when you are looking at the knee joint, you will be giving running commentary, not to the patient, but to the examiner. So you will say that I can't, there is no rash, no redness, no visible deformity, okay? No visible sign of trauma. So those are the things that you are going to say to your examiner. Every, every time you are checking something, you will have to give this running commentary to the examiner. Why it is important? Because they don't give you actual patient in the exam. So let's say you have, you have, you have done a palpation of the knee joint. Now that patient is normal patient. So when you are palpating the knee joint, patient, patient does not so show any tenderness. So you, you gave the running commentary to the examiner that there is no tenderness in the knee joint. Examiner then can say that, yes, there is tenderness in the medial joint line of this patient. So sometimes examiner will give you this positive finding when you give the running commentary, okay? 
So that's why it is important that you will have to give this running commentary to the examiner every time in a face-to-face -face exam. So that's the basics of physical exam. Now, let me discuss a little bit about what is the difference between an online physical exam versus face-to-face -face physical exam. Now, basically, there's a lot of difference, right? Because it's a whole lot of things that you are doing just on online and other you, you have a patient in front and you'll have to do that physical exam on that person. Now, you might be saying that which one is easy? It depends. If you are a person who is very confident, who, who are already working in Australian health system, and you are doing physical examination every day in your life, then I would say go for the face-to-face -face because that's easier, because you know what you are doing. You, you have that experience. But if you are not very confident, but you have a very good mouth, now saying that means that you have a very good way of talking. You can, you can be very convincing or your, your English is very good. So if that is the case, I would say online exam is the best mode of exam for you. Because in online physical examination, you just need to explain what you're going to do to a patient. So that's easier if you, if you, if you are very quick, if you, if you know how to talk appropriately, that's actually a really, really easier because you don't need to do a physical exam on a person in online examination. Whereas if it's a face-to-face -face physical exam, the physical examination cages are just physical exam. The task will be like a patient coming to you for an abdominal pain, do physical examination to this patient, give your diagnosis and differentials. That means there is no need of any history in here. So in this case, in face-to-face, -face, you'll have to do inspection, palpation, auscultation, everything of abdominal exam one by one on that person. And one by one, you will get some positive findings from the examiner. On the other hand, in online examination, because you will be doing over, over the Zoom session or over video, they just ask you, like you have got a patient who is coming to you with a sudden onset of abdominal pain, explain what physical examination you are going to do to the medical student. So there are a couple of questions that come in online physical exam. Let's explain the physical exam to the medical student. Second, explain to the patient or sometimes explain to the examiner. Sometimes they add that they specify which equipment you are going to use for this exam. Sometimes they say that discuss physical examination with anatomical landmark. So these three is the main thing. If you're talking to a medical student or to an examiner, then you can use a lot of medical jargon. But especially for an examiner, you can use medical jargon without explaining things. But to a medical student, you will have to explain, like if you are saying that you, <coughs> excuse me, if you are saying that you need to, you are going to palpate the epitrochlea lymph node in hematological exam, you will need to explain to the medical student that where exactly is the epitrochlear lymph node and why we are palpating it. So that's the medical student, a little bit more explanation is needed. To a patient, that's the trickiest part and hardest part because they don't understand anything. So you'll have to be very simple, non-medical jargons with these patients. So normally they don't ask, they don't ask too much of this explanation to the patient. That's good, but sometimes they, they do. In that case, you have to be very careful explaining things very simply without using too much jargons. All right. What is this anatomical landmarks? Obviously, like if you're talking about epitrochlear lymph node, you have to say where exactly we are palpating. That's anatomical landmark. So that's your online examinations. In online exam examinations, as you know that this is the online format. There will be, this is you, then there will be a role player, 
or sometimes medical student in physical examination. There will be an invigilator and examiner. examiner might not be there. Or if examiner is there, they are not going to talk to you. So in online exam, examiner does not talk to you at all. Sometimes they can give you some, some physical examination finding after you finish your explanation. So that's all that can happen in online exam. Is this clear so far, guys? All right, so that's good. Now, do we need to wear gloves? In face-to-face -face exam, yes, many times you will have to wear gloves. Sometimes they ask you, not, you don't need to do that, especially for mannequin examination, that must, that you will have to wear gloves. But in in face to face exam especially for this time period when you wash your hands after washing the hands make sure you like use the tissue paper and then wipe your hands and after that go for wearing the gloves if it is available most of the time examiner will say skip you can you can just do the physical examination as it is if they don't skip you then wear the gloves So this is the famous wipe approach for physical examination. So what is this wipe approach? Washing your hands, I for introduce, so introduce yourself, take permission for, for the physical examination, and then exposure. So you'll need to have a good exposure of the physical, physical examination part that you are going to do. Like if you're going to do a knee exam, you will need a good exposure of the knee joint, right? So that's the wipe approach, which is needed for your all physical examination. Now, give me one minute, guys. I can see that a lot of our students cannot join the Zoom session because we have a maximum 100 students for the class in Zoom. So I'll just give a post so that they can be in Facebook at least. Just hang on a second. All right, all good then. So that should be fine, let's proceed. There is no specific washing hand technique is required for it. Okay, just wash your hands with, with the soap or, or hand sanitizer, whatever it is there, just, just wash your hands. There is no specific things which you need to follow for it. Okay, because you're not going to do a surgical scrubbing at, at here, it's just about washing the hands. Moving on, now we're going to start with the knee examination. Remember one thing that 
this is your first class of physical exam and there will be a lot of questions in your head. And I'm sure that most of the questions will be answered throughout this physical examination classes. So we will go for it, but if you still have some, some questions, something that you don't understand, especially the basic difference between the two mode of exam, then please ask me again and again. I'm more than happy to discuss that. And we'll do some of the role plays throughout the classes and find out what's actually you are not understanding. We will start with knee examination today. So as you can see, the knee joint has a lot of structures which can involve in a patient who is coming for a knee pain. So you can see that the, normally this is your knee joint. It has these two cruciate ligament. One is anterior, another is posterior. Then it has medial meniscus, lateral meniscus, and it has medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament. These are the main structures that usually can get involved in a patient who is coming for a knee pain, especially after a trauma. Now, for any of the examinations, we always follow the geeky medics because it is, it is one of the best. So time to time, we will follow these geeky medics and We'll go through that so that you understand how to do this physical examination on a person. But we'll come to this a little late. So a 28 years old lady coming with knee pain while running for a few weeks. Do knee physical examination, give diagnosis and differential. So this is exactly the face-to-face -face format of physical exam. So first, we are going to discuss how we are going to do a face-to-face -face knee exam. And after that, we will show you how to do it as an online format, okay? So what is the approach? In a knee examination, first, you will start with the wipe approach. So you wash your hands, you introduce yourself with the patient, you take permission from the patient that what you are going to do and then you make sure patient have a good exposure. First of all, we will just go through the summary of this knee exam, and then we will go to the video, and then we will come back for the explanation of the whole thing. Okay, so that's the way to understand it properly. So first wipe approach, we will offer painkiller. We'll start with a general appearance that how patient is doing. Then ask the patient for walking and looking for some of the abnormalities. We will start with the inspection. In musculoskeletal system, we follow the look, feel, move. So we'll do the look. We do the look or inspection in three sides. Front side, then from the side view, and from the back view. We'll come to this explanation later on. After look, then we do the feel or palpation. And the palpation will be on a lying position. And the inspection will be on a standing position. In palpation, most of the time in musculoskeletal, we check the temperature, we check the tenderness in whole knee joint. After look, feel, then there is movement. We do active and passive movement. Look, feel, move, and then a spatial test. We have a range of a spatial test, so we will discuss, discuss each of these spatial tests. So there are patellar tap test and bulge test. This two is to look for any effusion in the knee joint. Then we do some of the other things. For chondromalacia patelli, we do a Clark test. For patellar tendonitis, we will do patellar tilt test, then patellar apprehension test for patellar dislocation, anterior and posterior dryer test for cruciate ligament, collateral ligament test, there are valgus and varus stress test, and then for meniscus, we have aplis grinding test. So these are the tests that we are, we are going to do for this knee examination, okay? Now, moving on to explanation of these things. First, you need to understand how this works. And after that, we will come back to the point. So let's have a look 
to the video, especially the how we initially start this physical exam in a face-to-face, -face. okay? So let's watch this video first. Hi, I'm Simon, one of the junior doctors. Can I just check your name and age, please? Hi, my name's Grace and I'm 25. Nice to meet you, Grace. Today I'd like to examine your knees. That'll involve me having a look, feel and move of them. Does that sound all right? Yeah, that's fine. Do you have any pain in the knees at all before we begin? No. Lovely. If we could start by you standing up for me, mm -hmm. and I'd like to watch you walk. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. So what they have done initially, they have done the wipe approach. They did not talk about washing the hands. They have done it before. So that's fine. So after wipe, then we are going to ask the patient for a gait. Okay, so let's have a look. So patient walk across the room and you give running commentary at this time. So, so when the patient is walking, what you will have to do is to give a running commentary to the examiner. So what you say in this case, you say that, I can see that patient is walking normally. There is no tilting to any side. There is no antalgic gait or neuropathic gait. The arm swing is normal. So those are the running commentary that you are giving to the examiner. Okay. And then patient will, will finish the walking, come in front of you and stand like this. And then you will do inspection. So you'll say to the patient, now I'm going to have a look at your knee examination from three sides, from your front, from your side, and from your back. Is that okay with you? Yes, doctor. And then you will start your front inspection. When you are doing the front inspection, you will give running commentary to the examiner that there, on front view of the knee inspection, there is no scar, no redness, no deformity, no asymmetry, no muscle wasting. Okay, so it, that's, that's the way. First, you need to understand what, what you are doing because you can, once you understand this fact, it becomes easier. So I'm, today is all about understanding the examination, understanding how we do this thing, okay? Now, you don't need to ask the patient to move like this. You can move around the patient, that's fine. Always remember, when you go to the back of a patient, always say that, and now I'm going to your back. So that's a very gentle way to do that. All right, Grace. So that's your inspection. We'll come to the point later on that what exactly we are looking for in each of these examinations. But first understand how, how to do this. If you could just lie back on the bed for me. Yeah. I'm just going to have a feel of your knees. Okay. Now assessing the temperature of the joint. Now in Geeky Medics, they have done a little bit, little bit abnormal thing. What I don't like in here is that we don't use our two hands to assess temperature. We use our one hand and always the dorsum of your hand to assess the temperature of the joints. Any joint examination or any examination, when you compare, you compare the normal side to the affected side. So you take the normal side first. Like let's say this patient came to you with a right knee joint pain. So what you will do, you will use your right hand dorsum like this one. First, you will take the left joint and then you'll go to the right joint. So always first do the normal side, then you do the affected side. And use just one hand to do the both, both side temperature check, not the two hands like him, okay? And what's the importance of checking the temperature? Because it, if it is an infection or inflammation, you can get a raised temperature in here. And then they're doing the tenderness. So you take the tenderness like this. 
you're checking the joint line. This is the medial joint line. Now that is the lateral joint line. That's the tibial tuberosity and head of the fibula. And then at the end, pocritial fossa. Okay. Have a look at that again because that's important part of your examination. So you start palpating from the quadriceps. Look at the position of the hand. This is exactly how you are going to do it. So you will be mainly feeling the knee joint with your both thumb and curling around your other fingers around the back of the knee joint. So you go down and you always, when you are doing that, look at the patient's face. So the normal joint first, then the affected joint. Always remember, even with the tenderness, first the normal side, then the abnormal side. Now we don't need to measure the quadriceps bulk in here, like how Geeky Medics is doing. Um. After that, they are doing the patellar cap test and bulk test, which we will come later on. We'll check the movement then. So first of all, could you just bend your right knee up for me and bring your heel up the bed? Lovely. That's the knee flexion. First, we will do an active movement. So ask the patient, can you please bend your knee? That's fine. You don't need to be very complex. So just again. to the bottom again. And could you do the same on the other side for me? Okay. And now same the movement first, the normal side first, then the abnormal side. Remember that, but because that's very important to now compare. Just completely relax your legs. I'm going to do those movements myself. Okay. 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 Now look at the position. When you are doing the passive knee flexion, your other hand should be on the patella. And what you are looking for, you are feeling for a crepitus. If you, feel, if you feel any crepitus while you're doing that, there are two possibilities. One, it could be either a chondromalacia patelli or it could be an osteoarthritis of the knee joint. So that's a very important thing not to miss. All right, I'm just going to pick up now that's what you really need to know from this Geeky Medics. We'll move now. So let's move on. So this is started. Now we'll do the approach. So let me, let me show you what exactly you will be doing in here. So you will say that first you go in, you introduce with the patient. So let's say patient name is Jenny. So you'll be saying, hi, Jenny, this is Dr. Arshan. I'm one of the doctor here. Today, I'm going to do a knee examination for you. Or you can say that I understand from the notes that you are having pain in your right knee joint. I'm very sorry to hear that. Do you want me to give any painkiller? No, doctor, that's fine. Well, that's all right then. So we are going to do a knee examination on you today. And that will involve me having a look at your knee, feeling your knee for any soreness, asking you to do some movement for me, and also, I'll be doing some special tests to find out the exact reason of your knee pain. Okay, so that's, that's your explanation of the physical exam. For the purpose of the exam, I need, a, I need a good exposure of your knee joint. So would you please remove your pants, but you can have your under, undergarments. I'm going to wash my hands. And when you are ready, just let me know. So that's the way how we do it. We don't need to just wash our hands initially when you go in. You can introduce with the patient and then you explain things to the patient. And then you can, when patient is removing the gown or removing the pants, 
then you can wash your hands and come back. But that's a tricky thing. In some cases, you will find out that patient is already exposed because other people is asking that because you will be rotating in your, in your exam hall. So unless you are the first candidate doing this physical exam, you will, most of the time you will see that patient is already exposed. Okay, that means they are not going to just like every time they are not going to put on the pants and removing it. They will just remove it and they will be like that. So in that case, when you are going into the room, you can wash your hands first and then do it. So it depends what you see when you go in, inside the room. If you see patient is not exposed fully, then you first introduce, explain the procedure, ask for the exposure. When patient is removing their, their shirts or pants, then you come back to the basin, wash your hands, and this is how you save your time also, okay? So you explain these things after that, and you also offer the painkiller. Once you have done this initial part, then you will say that, now, Jenny, first, I would like to have a general look on you. I can see my patient is sitting comfortably, no walking aids on, on, on her bedside, and there is no protective posture. Jenny, would you please stand up for me and walk for me? So then patient will walk, and when patient is walking, you will give running commentary. I can see patient is walking comfortably, there is no antalgic gait, normal arm swing is preserved. So gait is done, patient is in front of you. Then you will say, Jenny, now I'm going to have a look at your knee joint from, from your front, side, and back view. Is that okay with you? Yes, doctor. On the front side, I can see that my patient's supra and infrapatellar pouch is not obliterated. There is no swelling, no scar, no redness, no quadriceps muscle wasting, no bony deformity. Always remember for, for inspection, we, all, we follow this mnemonic called SSRRBMD. So what is this SSRRBMD? S means scar, another S is swelling, redness, rash, bony deformity and muscle wasting. So that's, you can use in almost every inspection. So swelling, scar, redness, rash, bony deformities or muscle wasting. Then you will go to the side of the patient and especially you will be looking for any hyperflexion or hyperextension deformity of the knee joint. So you, you can just comment that I can't see any hyperflexion or hyperextension deformity on the side view. You go to the back of the patient and comment that there is no swelling in the popliteal fossa. So that's some of the deformities. You can see in here, this is the fixed flexion deformity of the knee joint. Okay, if you compare these two knee joints, what you see, you can see that this side of the knee is having effusion. And you can see some of these valgus deformity, which you will not need to know for the exam purpose. They would not give it to you. Once you have done the inspection from the front, side, and back, then you go to the palpation. So until now, patient is standing. Then you ask the patient, Jenny, will you please lie on the couch for the, for, for the next examination? So patient will lie on the couch. And when patient lying on the couch, always say exactly what is the position that you want. So you can always say, Jenny, would you please lie on the couch by having your back on the bed, all right? So back on the bed means supine position. So after she lied down, then you will do a temperature and tenderness. So for temperature, again, you, what you are going to say to the patient, you are going to say to the patient that, Jenny, now I'm going to touch your knee joint to assess any raised temperature. Is that okay with you? Yes, doctor. Then you compare the both knee joint looking for any raised temperature. And you give the running commentary to the examiner that there is no rise of temperature in the affected knee joint. Then you come to the tenderness. You, you say to the patient that now I'm going to feel your each 
part of your knee joint yes and feeling for any soreness if you feel pain when i am touching it just let me know please but patient might not inform you you will have to always look at the patient face when you are doing it so you will start with the quadriceps muscle in here then this is the suprapatellar pouch then the patella then the patella tendon then there is tibial tuberous <clears throat> tibial tuberosity after that you have got medial joint line lateral joint line head of the fibula and ask the patient to bend the knee and you palpate the popliteal fossa or any baker cyst once you have done the full palpation or full palpation for tenderness then just give running commentary there is no tenderness over the quadriceps muscle supra or infrapatellar pouch knee joint line patellar tendon or tibial tuberosity okay so that's your checking the tenderness make sure you do the tenderness very really good because this is the important part there are some cases where nothing will be positive only one thing positive that the tibial tuberosity is tender if if a patient coming to you like a young patient and having a tibial tuberosity tenderness nothing else is positive what might be your differential diagnosis very good dr safa and dr hana osgood schlatter syndrome or Os osgood schlatter disease it's important for the exam now let's say a, a child coming to you having a fever and tender tibial tuberosity osteomyelitis right see that this is exactly how you will need to catch this point other otherwise examiner will give you this finding if you don't know then you will never catch what examiner is giving to you good we have to list all of this point for what dr vincent it's not about listing you will just need to say like just say to the examiner that there is no tenderness in the quadriceps supra and infrapatellar pouch patella patella tendon tibial tuberosity all of these thing you will just need to give commentary so you have done your palpation after palpation you move on to the movement so movement you already know so you will ask the patient now we are going to assess your knee joint movement first will you please bend your knee for me you can start with the normal knee first and then the abnormal one like will you please bend your right knee then bend the left knee and then that's flexion and then just straight your knee joint for me please that will be your extension of the knee now in every other musculoskeletal system exam if patient is able to do active movement we don't need to do the passive movement but in this case because you have some finding that you are looking for even if patient is able to do active knee movement you will do a passive movement so then you will say now i am going to do this movement by myself so you will just do the flexion extension and then just at the end give running commentary to the examiner that active and passive movement is normal there is no crepitus on the knee joint so until now that's your main physical exam after that you move on to the spatial test and knee joint has like six or seven spatial test this is one of the largest physical exam for that you will ever find out so for the knee is knee joint spatial test first we will be assessing any patellar or any knee joint effusion so for knee joint effusion we do two test one is called patellar tap test another is called patellar bulge test so patellar tap test is something like this just by looking at it you know what they are doing so in patellar tap test especially if there is a large amount of fluid in the knee joint then this thing will be positive 
So you explain to the patient that now I'm going to do some special test for you. First, I will start to check for any fluid in your knee joint. Okay, so you don't need to say what, what is the test name because patient doesn't need. So you can always say that now I'm going to check for any fluid collection in your knee joint. So can you please straight your both knee joint? What I'm going to do is to put my left hand into your thigh and then I will bring any fluid from above down to your kneecap. I will keep my hand over there and then I will press your kneecap downwards and I will look for if, if the kneecap is floating or not. Okay, now if you want to make it simple, it's always also very easy to do that. So you can always say, say to the patient, now I'm going to check for any fluid accumulation in your knee joint. Is that all right with you? Yes, doctor. So I'm going to use my left hand to assess, to, to, to bring any fluid down to the kneecap and then press your kneecap. Is that okay with you? Yes, doctor. So this is how you do it. You, with your one hand, you bring all the fluids from the top down to the patella and using your other hand, you press the patella downwards. If there is a lot of fluid in the knee joint, you will feel that patella is floating over those fluids. And that's the positive test. So let's have a look how we do it. This moves any to the top of down the front. One hand is pushed fusion or swelling. One hand is pushed down the front of the leg to the top of the patella. This moves any fluid in the leg down the thigh to the knee. Keeping pressure on, the therapist will use the other hand to press down or tap on the top of the patella. If the kneecap doesn't move much, then there is little or no swelling. However, if it obviously moves up and down when pressed, then this is a positive test. The patella is being pushed upwards from fluid and swelling accumulated underneath. Okay, so that's how you do the patella tap test. Now, if you're running out of time and if you are slow with the physical exam, when you explain to the patient, just say one line. Now I'm going to check for some fluid accumulation in your knee joint. First, I'm going to press down your kneecap and feel for any fluid underneath. That's all. If you can make it simple, there is no problem with that. As much simple as possible or face to face. In online, we discuss a lot, like everything we discuss. But for face to face, make it as simple, as short as possible. Because you, will, you are doing this examination on a person then giving the running commentaries, so it takes a lot of time. So make it very short. So that's your patellar tap test. Then the next test that we do is called patellar bulge test. It's now if patellar tap test is positive, do we need to do patellar bulge test? No need. But if patellar tap test is negative, then to assess for any small joint effusion, then you can do this patellar bulge test. So it's mainly for a very small joint effusion. So in this case, patient will be lying fully relaxed and knee extended. Again, you will empty the suprapatellar pouch by sliding your left hand down the thigh to the patella, just like the tap test. In here, you will stroke the medial side of the knee joint to move any excess fluid to the lateral side of the knee joint. You'll see how it happens. So if this is the knee joint, you will move your hand from the medial side to the lateral side to move any fluid from here to the, to the lateral side. Then you stroke the lateral side of the knee joint to move any fluid in the lateral side back to the medial side. And every time you are moving the fluid, you will see a bulge on the other side and that bulge will show that there is some presence of fluid in the knee joint. Let's have a look first. So have a look that this is exactly what you are going to do. So you will ask the patient, now I'm going to use my hand to move any fluid in your knee joint from the inner side to the outer side and then from outer to the inner side. So 
you're going to use your dorsum of one of the hand and just this is also called swipe test so you are swiping your any fluid on the medial side to the lateral side and you look for any any bulge in this side then again similarly when you come here same you will just move move your hand just like this to move any fluid on this side towards the medial side so that's what we call as patellar bulge test or swipe test let's see how it happens this next exam is called the bulge test it tests for effusion or fluid on the knee. Inspect the knee, gently palpating the knee for any gross effusion, then taking the back of your hand, gently pushing up on the medial side of the knee, and then again on the lateral side of the knee, seeing if any fluid pushes medial or lateral as you do. Now it should not be just like this. So you, you push the fluid from here back to the lateral side. You look for any bulge there and then again swipe the swipe from lateral side to the medial side okay that should be the thing and before that you will also have to make sure with your other hand bring all the fluid from the thigh down to the patella okay so that's how we do the swipe test or bulge test is this clear for everyone and normally dr rekha we are we usually stand on the right side of the patient most of the time. Yeah, so left hand will be on the, on the up, up side. That means with the left hand, you're going to bring all the fluid from the thigh down to the patella. And with the other hand, you will be just doing the swipe test. So that's your patellar tap test and bounce test. Any questions so far, guys? You guys are understanding me? I know it is a little hard and new for most of you, but anytime you are not understanding, let me know. We can discuss it. Moving on to the next one. So once you have done the patellar tap test and bounce test, the next is patellar Clark test. The Clark test is done for chondromalacia patella. So in this test, first of all, you fix the kneecap by one hand and then press the kneecap and ask the patient to squeeze the thigh muscle. Let's have a look how we do it. So this is exactly how it's done. So you will ask the patient to fully extend their knee joint and after that, you will say that you will fix the kneecap by one hand. So see that with your one hand, you are going to fix the patella. And then the, with the other hand, you will just press the patella downwards while patient is squeezing the or contracting the thigh muscle, which is your quadriceps muscle. When you are pressing downwards and patient is squeezing, the quadriceps muscle, if they complain any pain, all right? If especially if the pain is under the patella and patient, patient cannot do the contraction of the muscle because it make it worse, that's the time it is a positive Clark test. So for Clark test, you use your one hand to fix the patella. With your other hand, you press the patella downwards while patient is contracting there high muscle. So when you say to the patient, you will say that now I'm going to do a special test. So I'm going to fix your kneecap by my one hand and I will press your kneecap downwards and please squeeze your thigh muscle at that time. If you feel any pain, just let me know. If patient feels pain, it means patient might have chondromalacia patella. So that's the Clark test. After Clark test, we have patellar tilt test. And patellar tilt test will be positive in another knee condition known as patellar tendonitis. In patellar tilt test, the name says what exactly you will have to do. You'll have to tilt the patella upwards. So with your one hand, you are going to 
tilt the patella so that the inferior pole get exposed. Okay. So again, in this case, patient will be lying relaxed and knee fully extended. With your one hand, you are going to press the patella to tilt it upwards so that the inferior border of the patella get exposed. And now that the inferior border is exposed, with your other hand, thumb and index finger, you are going to squeeze the patella tendon. And when you squeeze the patella tendon, a patient feels a lot of pain. That is a positive patella tilt test. And that is what you get in patella tendonitis. So you can see that tilt the patella by exerting pressure over its superior pole. So you are tilting it like this. This will expose the inferior pole, not now palpate the surface under the inferior pole. And when you palpate this under surface, that's actually the patellar tendon that you are palpating. And when you palpate or you squeeze the patellar tendon in between your thumb and index finger, if patient, patient feels a sharp pain, that's what you get in patellar tendonopathy or tendonitis. Every test in, in knee joint, it will be on a patient, not on a dummy, Dr. Omid, in face-to-face. -face. Good. Now that we have done two important tests, one is Clark test and patellar tendonitis test, which is your TIL test, the next test that we are going to do is called patellar apprehension test. Patellar apprehension test will be positive in a condition called patellar dislocation. So what do we do in here? Let me show you the video. As I'm in the midst of applying for residency right now, wish me luck, Grammarly has again been a lifesaver with my application. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate the patella apprehension test for patella lying supine or So for patella apprehension test, we ask the patient to lie down the couch and the patient's knee joint will be in a 30 degree flexion. Okay, so ask the patient to bend the knee and make it as a 30 degree flexion, just like this. Once patient is in 30 degree knee flexion, then we are going to do the apprehension test. Sitting on the bench with the knee flexed to 30 degrees. The quad should be relaxed to allow passive movement of the patella. With the thumb of both hands, press on the medial side. Now look at the positioning. So with your thumb of the both hand, you are going to exert pressure on the medial side and try to move the patella towards the lateral side. And when you do that, if there is a patella dislocation, patient will be very surprised and apprehended because it will give you a lot of pain. With the thumb of both hands, press on the medial side of the patella to exert laterally directed pressure. In a positive test, the patient may be surprised by the lateral displacement of the patella and feel uncomfortable or apprehensive as the patella reaches the point of maximal lateral displacement. The patient may even reach for your hands or attempt to straighten the knee to pull the patella back into relatively normal position. Okay, so that's your patellar apprehension test. Now there are three more tests that we'll have to do for the important structures for the knee joint. Now, remember the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament? For anterior and posterior cruciate ligament, we do anterior and posterior dryer test. There are some other tests like Lachman test for, an for anterior cruciate ligament, which we don't need to do in the exam. At least if we can do anterior and posterior dryer test, that is fine. So we're going to do this cruciate ligament test now. Now this is the positioning for anterior dryer test. So in this case, patient will be again bending the knee, like at least 45 degree like this. 
So position the patient supine on the clinical couch with their knee flexed to 90 degree. Wrap your hands around the proximal tibia. So wrap your hands around the proximal tibia. Your both thumb will be on the tibial tuberosity and the other fingers will be curling towards the back of the knee joint, just like this. So position your thumb over the tibial tuberosity, ask the patient to keep their legs as relaxed as possible. And then you are going to pull the tibia anteriorly, that means pull the tibia towards you, feel for any excessive movement of this tibia. With healthy cruciate ligament, there should not be any movement, but if there is cruciate ligament laxity or rupture, you will be see, you'll, you'll be able to find out that the tibia can be easily moved towards you. And that suggests that maybe the cruciate ligament is no longer stable enough to keep the stability of the knee joint. So when you move the tibia towards you or anteriorly, that's anterior dry test, and when you push it downwards, that's posterior dry test. And for, for this spatial test, you don't need to do it on a normal side first and then to the abnormal. You can do it to the abnormal side only because you will not have that much time in the exam. But for this anterior dryer test, you'll have to do it on the normal side first, then to the abnormal. Because many patients have, have a kind of like a naturally lax knee joint. And that does not suggest that they have an anterior dryer test positive. So you'll have to compare their normal side to the abnormal side. So that's why for a dryer test, you'll have to do it on the both. Now let's see if we can show you how to do this anterior dryer test. I think Geeky Medics has it. ligaments in your knee now let me know. so look look at the like how they're explaining the things to the patient okay grace i'm just going to examine the ligaments in your knee now let me know if you have any discomfort at all and we can stop okay so that's anterior dryer test and now this is the posterior dryer test I'm just going to lift your legs one by one. Cool. So that explains how to do it. Moving on. After that, now the, the most complex one is this collateral ligament test, unfortunately. So there are two kinds of collateral ligament tests. One is for medial collateral ligament, which is called valgus stress test. And for lateral collateral ligament, we have varus stress test. Now you will have to understand the basic of it. Remember where is the medial collateral and where is the lateral collateral? And you are going to strain those ligaments for this test, okay? So let's have a look. So this will be the positioning for medial collateral ligament. Now, you do remember that medial collateral ligament should be on this side. So your one hand, the, let's say your left hand, will be on the lateral aspect of the knee joint, and your other hand will be on the medial aspect of the ankle joint. So this is the cross positioning. And when you are, and it's very easy to remember because for medial collateral ligament, you are keeping the medial side of the knee joint free. So one hand on the lateral side of the knee joint, other hand on the medial side of the ankle. With, with this positioning, 
if you need to strain this ligament, where do you need to move this leg? Just tell me that if you need to strain this ligament, where will you move this leg? To the outward, like this side, or to the inward? Outwards, right? So that's exactly what you're going to do. You are going to move this leg outwards while pressing downwards through this hand. When you are doing hand, doing it, if patient complains pain on this side of the knee joint, that's medial collateral ligament test positive. Okay? We'll show you the video. You'll understand that. That's no problem. And then there are lateral collateral ligament tests. For lateral collateral ligament, it will be totally opposite, which means in lateral collateral ligament, one hand will be on this medial side, other hand will be on the lateral side of the ankle, and you will be pressing inwards. Okay, now let's have a look to the video so that you understand it. Sorry for this ads. I'm going to demonstrate the varus stress test for lateral collateral ligament injury. So we're first having a look at the varus stress test for lateral collateral ligament. Now, do you need to do like this? No, I would not say that like put your patient's leg on your thigh, especially if you're a female candidate, it's not very really appropriate. So you don't need to do that, even not for a male candidate. So just use this, the previous one, that will be fine. Now, there are some giants in Australia whose weight of the leg might be similar to your body's weight. Now, in that case, it will be different, diff very difficult for you to raise their leg in the exam. So in that case, you can do this position, okay? But for most of the other cases, that's fine. You can just, you can just raise the leg just by what we have shown. Okay. So for lateral collateral ligament, what we are going to do is possible. Have a look. Grab onto the lower leg with one hand just above the ankle joint and fixate with the other hand on the medial side of the femur. Apply lateral rotation in the knee joint and perform passive adduction in the knee joints to put stress on the lateral collateral ligament. So what, what they're doing, they're, going, they're doing inwards movement so that they can strain the lateral collateral. Okay, so that's, that's how we have to do it. Do we need to do the lateral rotation? No need. Consequently. Okay, so that's how you're going to do the lateral collateral. Let's see if we can find out the medial collateral. Now let's look at the variation in 30 degrees of flexion, which was used in the diagnostic model of the study. The extent of the side of the bench, this helps in preventing hip rotation. Then again, secure the ankle with one hand and place the other diagnostic model. Look at the test done in zero degrees of flexion. Hold the knee in full extension, secure the ankle with one hand and place the other hand around the knee so that the thenar is against the fibula. So have a look at here. So normally it's not the correct position. You just need to put your hand on the lateral side of the knee. That should be fine. And the medial side of the knee will be free like this. Head. Then push medially against the knee and laterally against the ankle in an attempt to open the knee joints on the inside. And if possible, try to palpate the medial joint line for gapping and pain. So the only thing that you are going to do in here with your this hand, the right hand, you are going to press it inwards. And with your left hand, you are going to push this leg outwards. When you are pushing it outwards, you are going to strain this medial collateral. And if patient complains pain at that time, that's your positive. Valgus stress test for medial collateral ligament. Okay.
The last test is your Aplis grinding test. The Aplis grinding test is done for meniscus examination or meniscus tear. So you remember the lateral and medial meniscus. So if there is any meniscus injury, this Aplis grinding test might be positive. Now there are a lot of things that can be done in this test also because Aplis grinding test involves changing the patient's position like this. So now the patient has to be in a prone position and with their knee flexed to 90 degrees, that you are going to apply a axial pressure. So you are going to put a pressure called axial pressure to the foot and then rotate this tibia internally and externally. When you rotate it internally, if patient complains pain, that's medial meniscus, if you're, when you are rotating it externally, if patient complains pain, that's lateral meniscus tear. Okay? So let's have a look how they are going to do it. To perform Apley's test, the patient lies prone with the involved knee flexed to 90 degrees. The examiner stands on the side of the examination table with both hands on the plantar aspect of the subject's foot and heel. So see the positioning, your, the knee is 90 degree flexion, your hand is one, one hand on the other hand, and then you put the axial pressure downwards and move the tibia internally and externally. The examiner medially and laterally rotates the tibia while applying an axial load through the tibia. The same medial and lateral rotation should then be repeated with a distraction force. So that's fine, you don't need to do this one. So that's your Aplis grinding test, okay? Now, if you need to know about the McMurray's test, we have a McMurray's test in here, which we can see. Let's squeeze in a This test was as low as 63 of all the clinic pine line position with the test in supine line patient. So patient will be in the supine position. In supine line position with the tested knee fully flexed. Then rotate the tibia medially and bring the knee into extension. You want to repeat this process a couple of times with a different angle of knee flexion in order to test the whole posterior aspect of the lateral meniscus. In order to test the medial meniscus, bring the knee... So again, so did you understand? So you do a full flexion of the knee joint, medial rotation of the knee, and then you, with the medial rotation of the knee, you extend the knee joint. Let's have a look again, and that's for lateral meniscus knee fully flexed. Then rotate the tibia medially and bring the knee into extension. You want to repeat this process a couple of times with a different angle of knee flexion in order to test the whole posterior aspect of the lateral meniscus. In order to test the medial meniscus, bring the knee into full flexion and laterally rotate the tibia. Okay, so that's easy. I would say that if you don't want to waste your time, then you can also do this McMurray's test. It's also very easy rather than doing the Aplis grinding one. Okay, all good. So for medial meniscus, what you're going to, for lateral meniscus, what you're going to do, you're going to full flex the knee joint do the medial rotation of the knee or medial rotation of the tibia and then full extension. 
that's for lateral meniscus. Okay, when you do the external rotation of the tibia and then do the extension, that's for medial meniscus. Cool. That's everything that we need to do for the knee examination, right? So that brings us to the finishing of knee joint. Now, when you finish a joint examination, always say that at the end that you would like to finish this knee examination by doing ankle and hip joint. So always one joint above and one joint below, we need to do it. Yes, that's right, Dr. Sana, you will have to complete this in eight minutes. As I say, that this is the, one of the longest physical examination. But with time, with a lot of practice, it will be fine, trust me. And yes, you will need to remember all the test names because when you give running commentary to the examiner, you will say that McMurray's test is negative. Just that, that's the only, only thing that you are going to say. Or Apley's grinding test is positive. So yes, the name is important, that's for examiner. And yes, you will have to do all these tests. And Dr. Safa, yes, only one is fine. You don't need to do both Apley's and McMurray, only one. All good, any question guys? No, not all of these tests on the both knees. The look, feel, move will be on both knees. A special test will be on only the affected knee. But just that patellar apprehension test, not, not the apprehension, the anterior joyer test, you will have to do it on the both side. All right, so if I give you a summary, think about the test name again. So what we are going to do in here, first, we are going to do the wipe approach, general appearance. We ask the patient to walk, that's the gait. Then look, feel, move. In the look, in the three plane, we are going to do it. Then we do the movement, sorry. Then we do the feel for temperature and tenderness. We do the movement, active and passive. Then we do the spatial test. Two tests for effusion, tap test and bulge test. Then we do the, some of the other things. One is Clark test for chondromalacia patelli. We do patellar tilt test for tendonitis, apprehension test for dislocation, for cruciate ligament anterior and posterior joint test. Then there are collateral ligament test and meniscal tear test. You can change it, that's fine. You don't need to keep the same order, but look, feel, move should be done first, then the special test. And you don't need to do all these tests on the both side. You only, you do the look, feel, move on the both side, and then the special test can be done only on the affected side. Yeah. If tap test is positive, no need of bulge test. Now, we're just going to show you how to explain it in an online format. So let's say the task is patient having a pain and you need to explain it to a medical student. So what you are going to do? So you can follow the same approach for every other online exam. So say that, hi, John, this is Dr. X, one of the RMO in this hospital. It is very nice to meet you. So which, you, which year you are in currently? So you can have some idea that what's the level of understanding for the medical student, fourth year doctor. So that's great, it must be very exciting for you. Well, I'm very glad to show you one of my patients today. So we have, got a eight, we have got a 28 years old lady presented with chronic knee pain while running. I'm going to discuss with you on how to examine her knee joint. If you do not understand at any point, please do not hesitate to ask me again. Now, before we do a knee exam, first we need to think what are the normal structures of a knee joint. So in short, knee joints have connects femur with the tibia, 
which is stabilized by some ligaments, tendons, and meniscus. So we are going to assess those ligaments and tendons and also some other things which can give knee pain. So you are okay with me so far? Yes, doctor. Before we start examining her knee joint, first we need to wash our hands, introduce ourselves, take a proper consent about the exam and request for an adequate exposure of the examining part, which in this case is her lower limbs. Next, we should offer her some painkiller in case she is in pain now. Once she has given the consent, we will start with a general appearance, looking for any protective posture or walking aid. Then we will request her to stand and observe if she is able to bear weight on the painful leg. And then, now in here, I just changed it. You can do as, as it is in the note. After that, we will do inspection of our knee joint from front, looking for any swelling, scar redness, deformities, then from the side for any hyperflexion or extension deformity, and from the back, looking for any Baker cyst. Then we will ask her to walk, and we will observe for any abnormal gait, and if the normal arm swing is preserved. Are you with me so far? Is there any question? Always involve the, the other person. Otherwise, you will just talk and talk and they will sleep. After that, we will ask the patient to lie on her back for palpation of the knee joint. First, we will check the temperature of the both side using our dorsum of the hand, looking for any increased temperature, which can suggest joint infection or inflammation. Then we will check the tenderness over different part of the knee joint, including all of these things that we have done. And we'll also palpate the back of the knee joint for any popliteal fossa baker cyst. After palpation, we will check for movement, active and passive movement. Knee has two movement, flexion and extension. So we'll ask the patient to bend the knee and then straight it to check the active range of movement, followed by feeling for any crepitus when we are doing the passive movement of the joint. Then we will do some spatial test. First, to check for any knee joint effusion, we will do patellar tap test and balls test. So then you explain how you do the patellar tap test and patellar balls test. After that, we will do three special tests for patellar injury. One for chondromalacia patella, for patellar tendonitis, and patellar dislocation. First, for Clark test, we will do this, this, this. Then you discuss what, are, what is patellar teal test. They didn't discuss patellar apprehension test. After that, we are going to check for cruciate ligament tear by doing anterior and posterior dryer test. Discuss what is the dryer test, and then say that you are going to check for medial and lateral collateral ligament by valgus and varus stress test. Explain this test. After that, just say that for meniscus, you are going to do any of these McMurray's or Apkis grinding test. And lastly, we will finish with examining one joint above and below. In this case, we will do ankle and hip joint. Lastly, we will thank the patient, discuss our findings, and most likely diagnosis and further management, and wash our hands. Do you have any questions? So that will be the explanation for online exam. You will have to explain these things throughout this eight-minute time. Okay, now what are the differential diagnoses? As we have been discussing that this will be your differential diagnosis for knee pain. So it could be chondromalacia patella, it can be patellar tendonitis, patellar dislocation, could be osgood schlatter osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, septic arthritis. So anything which causes knee joint pain, it can be your DD. And then there are some explanation. What is chondromalacia patella? Chondromalacia patella is that due to repetitive friction of the back of the patella, so this is the back of the patella, against the lower part of the thigh bone, okay, the covering of the patella known as cartilage undergoes some changes. That is what we call as chondromalacia patella. So obviously this undersurface of the patella has friction against this femur cartilage. And if it causes like a, some changes, some strain, some destruction of this cartilage, that is what we will call as 
Undu Malishi patella. For patellar tendonitis, it is an inflammation of the patellar tendon, which is a rope like structure which connects your kneecap to the shin bone or leg bone. And that mainly happens due to repetitive strain, especially for people who do a lot of jumping, exercise, running, etc. Okay, so that's all about the knee examination, guys. I feel like you at least have an idea at the moment that how we would do the face-to-face -face examination and how we are going to do the online examination. Any questions so far? Those of you who are in Facebook, if you have any question, you can always write it in the comment section. I will always check it. All right, guys. So what we are going to do is just take a 10 minute break. And after that, we are going to do another one, which is the wrist cut injury. That's also one of the important case that we're going to do tonight, okay? So 10 minute break and then we will start again. I can see that Dr. Patma has asked, in face to face, we enter the room, introduce to the examiner, then straight go and wash the hand, then you only introduce to patient. Yes, that's how we can do it, that's fine. And also if you, if you, go in, introduce with the patient, explain the procedure, and then come and do the washing the hands, that's also fine. No need of any neurological exam, this is entirely a musculoskeletal examination. No need for any reflex or anything. The cages that is important for exam is, obviously Osgood slaughter comes. It's also important is patella tendonitis, Important is your chondromalacia patelli. These are the most important one. Now, anything can come in exam, so always be very open in the exam. All right, so 10 minute break, guys, and then we'll start our another one, which is wrist cut injury. Also, very important case for exam. Thank you.
All right, everyone, let's start again. So we are going to start with the rash examination. So not the rash examination, we'll be doing the wrist cut injury. Now wrist cut injury is one of the commonest case in exam. And also it is pretty difficult as well because you will need to understand uh, the neurology of the hand and also all other structures that's, that might be involved if someone has a wrist cut. So that's the important thing. Now we'll do the face-to-face -face format first. So a 30 year old male came with a knife injury at the flexor aspect of the left wrist. And this is the picture that is provided. Bleeding has stopped with pressure. Your task in here would be do the physical examination, give running commentary to the examiner, and give diagnosis with reason. In case of online examination, they will ask you to teach medical student about the physical exam with anatomical landmark and give diagnosis with reason. Now, when you get something like this, what you are looking for, especially if you look at this picture, you can see that this is a, like a, almost, a, almost the whole area of the wrist has been damaged, or it might involve any tendon, any nerve, muscles around this area, right? But there is no active bleeding, that's good. So in here, a wipe approach, so introduce yourself, wash your hands, take permission, offer some painkiller in here because patient might be in a lot of pain and also make sure you assess their vitals like blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate, all of it. Once you have done that, then you will start with a general appearance. So on general appearance, you will be looking for if the patient looks comfortable or in distress due to pain. After that, you will start with the look feel move. In the look or inspection, you will do inspection on both palmar side and dorsal side. So this is the palmar aspect. On the palmar aspect, you will be given the running commentary to the examiner, say that on the, on the palmar aspect, I can see that there is a longitudinal cut at the wrist about five centimeter in size, no active bleeding. I can't see any thinner or hypothinner muscle wasting normal finger posture is lost. Now, in many cases, they will give you a full picture of this. If you put your hand on your table with your palmar aspect upwards, just like this, look at how your finger posture is. You will always find that it is always in a semi-flexed posture. And that's how it is normally. But in a patient, who might have some loss of this tendon, they might be, this semi-flexed posture might be lost. So it might be totally extended. So in many cases in here, you will get a picture showing that. So if you, if you get a picture like that, like the normal semi-flexed finger posture is lost, then just comment on that. If not, then just say that normal finger posture is present. So that's the Palmer aspect examination. After that, you will ask the patient, can you please turn your hand over? Or can you please turn over your hand? When patient turn over, then you will examine the dorsal aspect for any other injuries, any redness, any scar, any other deformities, or any other sign of trauma. It's not very important to take the dorsal aspect here. It's mainly the palmar aspect, which is important. Okay, so on the look, what you will do to the patient, you will say that now I'm going to have a look on your hand. Will you please put your both hands in front so that I can have a look with your palmar side upwards. 
okay, with your palmar side facing upwards. So then patient will put their hands in front and their palmar aspect of the hand will be upwards like this. Once you have examined the palmar aspect, ask the patient to turn over their hand to examine the dorsal aspect. Once you have done the inspection, then you will move to the feel or palpation. On the palpation, we'll again do the temperature, pulse, capillary refilling time. Now, obviously it will be tender. Do we need to check the tenderness? It's not very important. Sorry, yes, it will, it will not be longitudinal. It, will, it should be a transverse. Sorry, I think it's a, it was a mistake over there. So in the fill, first start with the temperature, just like before. So what you will say to the patient, say, now I'm going to assess the temperature in your hands to check for, to check for any raised temperature or any reduced temperature. Now, which one is important in here? Raised temperature or reduced temperature? Guys? Nice. Reduced temperature, right? Why? Because if patient's vascularity or if the vessel has been cut, then there will not be very much, like a normal warmth of the fingers will be lost. So that's the reason why you are checking for temperature, especially where will you be checking the temperature? Proximal to the cut or distal to the cut? Distal to the cut, right? Because that's how you will know that if there is any injury to that vessel especially for any vessels around the wrist. Which vessel you have got? Radial artery, ulnar artery. So that's the important thing. Do not do anything stupid because a lot of candidates start checking temperature from the elbow. Why? Is there any reason of checking temperature from the elbow? No reason. What you are checking? So always reason. Always reason in your head that what I am looking for and just do that. If you just do it do the same thing for every exam, then examiner will catch you. They will know that you just came here by memorizing some notes, nothing else. So take the temperature, distal to the cut, and compare with the normal size. So first, using the dorsum of your hand, check the temperature over the normal side and then to the affected side. After that, we are going to check the radial pulse of this patient. Now, again, it is a tricky thing to check the radial pulse, pulse in a patient who has injury exactly at the same area. If it is possible, then you can check the radial pulse over here, but it always depends. If patient complains too much pain, then you will not do it. Okay, now again, Taking the radial pulse here does not matter because it is it might not get injured in here. It will get injured over here. So taking the radial pulse would not be very, very important in here, but it always depends where you get the cut. If the cut is here, you can always check it at around this area. Okay, now try to do it. Even if you can, then try to check the radial pulse over here. Okay, so you'll say that now I'm going to take your pulse of the hand, looking for any injury to your vessels around the wrist, or looking for any injury to the blood pipes around your wrist. Is that okay with you? I know that it is very closer to your cut injury. If you feel any pain, or if you feel uncomfortable, just let me know, I will stop immediately. So say something like that, patient will not bother too much. No need of checking ulnar pulse, just radial pulse is fine. It's very really hard to find the ulnar pulse. So check the radial pulse. After checking the radial pulse, we should also check the capillary refilling time. Now, always remember what you are looking for in a cut injury. You are looking for injury to the vessels. You are looking to the injury for nerves, muscles, and tendons. That's the main thing that might be injured. So the vessels, especially temperature, 
pulse capillary flame time this will give you the any possibility of injury to the vessels so we are checking the temperature we are checking the pulse and now we are checking the capillary refilling time so to check the capillary refilling time apply a gentle pressure on the distal phalanx of patient's finger any finger just apply a gentle pressure on the nail bed for 5 second and then release in healthy individual the pallor that happen after you compress over the nail bed should return to normal color in less than 2 second more than 2 second it suggests that there is some reduced perfusion and that suggests the possibility of injury to the vessels okay so check the capillary refilling time now all of these things we will discuss we will show you videos how to do a pulse examination how to do the capillary refilling time examination everything will be discussed and shown in a video so that's fine don't worry on that at the moment if you are not sure how to do a capillary refilling time it's very easy just press over a nail bed and release after 5 second if the initial pallor does not come back to normal within 2 second that's abnormal so we have done the look and feel no need of checking for tenderness it will be tender obviously and it will not give you any finding so tenderness is not very important after look feel we do the movement in movement we are going to check for a wrist flexion extension we are going to check the finger movement we are going to check the thumb movement now there is a lot of movement in here so first of all we are going to check the wrist movement then we are going for the finger movement and especially we are also checking the thumb movement let's have a look so this is your wrist flexion and extension now what we are going to do first of all you will need to know that which muscle or tendon gives you wrist flexion extension if you look at here so wrist flexion will be done by flexor carpi radialis and some of them will be also done by flexor carpi ulnaris and palmaris longus so these are the muscle which is involved with wrist flexion and wrist flexion usually will be affected if there is any injury to the palmar aspect of the hand so first of all we will ask the patient can you please bend your wrist upwards so bending the wrist upwards that's your prayer sign so you can always show to show to the patient when you will do it and patient will follow it so ask the patient now we are going to do some movement of your wrist joint will you please follow me so and at that time you can say let's do a prayer sign like this or let's move your move your wrist upwards like a prayer sign So when patient doing this prayer sign, that's your extension of the wrist joint. And then ask the patient now, try to bend your wrist downwards like me. So you will do like this, and patient will follow it, and that's your wrist flexion. Okay, so we are doing a wrist flexion and extension. Which one will be affected? The wrist flexion, because if you come here. so in in here you will have your flexor carpi radialis and flex flexor carpi ulnaris especially if there is a injury to the flexor carpi ulnaris especially that's that will be in this area the patient will have trouble with the wrist flexion okay so either if there is a injury at this aspect flexor carpi ulnaris flexor carpi radialis any of this can be injured if there is injury of any of this tendon or muscle patient's wrist flexion will be affected okay so if wrist flexion is 
painful or if patient is not able to do the wrist flexion, then you can comment that there is a likely chance that the flexor carpi ulnaris or radialis has been damaged. Now, the thing is that do we need to say all of it in the exam? No need. Sometimes examiner like if you say a little bit of the name of the muscles and tendon. No, you don't need to remember everything. Just a little bit time to time if you use, that should be fine. Like in here, let's say you ask the patient, can you please bend your wrist upwards? Can you please bend your wrist downwards? When you ask the patient to bend the knee upwards, patient was able to do it because extension is fine. When you ask the patient to bend the knee downwards, which is the reverse prayer sign like this, that time patient was not able to do it. What that suggests? It suggests the wrist flexion is affected. And that means that there is a chance the flexor carpi ulnaris or radialis has been damaged. So when you give the commentary, you can say that there is a loss of wrist flexion and likely chance that flexor carpi ulnaris or radialis has been damaged. So that's how you can use a little bit of this knowledge and examiner will be very happy with that. But you don't need to do for all of the other movements, just a little bit that you can remember, okay? Once you have done the flexion extension of the wrist, then there is finger movement. So finger, not talking about the thumb, the other fingers. So finger has flexion extension, abduction and adduction. Let's have a look to some of the finger movements. So what I'm going to do first is if you just make a fist. So when patient make a fist, so ask the patient, can you please make a fist for me? That's finger flexion. Can you then straight it? When patient is straight it again, that's finger extension. So making a fist, finger flexion, straight it, finger extension. For me, okay, and then relax and turn your hands over and spread your fingers up and out as best you can. So ask the patient, can you please spread your fingers like me? When patient is spread the finger, that's finger abduction. And then ask the patient, now please close it together. That's finger adduction. Excellent. Now, if you just relax on it and let me move your fingers, make sure. Okay. So these are your main finger movements. Now, in this case, what we are looking for, you can get a loss of finger flexion in this case. How? Because finger flexion will be given by some of the, some of the tendons which, supply, which can get injured in that cut injury to the to the palmar aspect of the wrist. So finger flexion is given by especially two important muscles and tendon. One is your flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus. And then there are some of the others, which is not very important. Now, this is important part of your exam and examiner wants to know it. So you'll have to say that. So, if a patient is unable to do finger flexion at all, there is a chance that FDS or FDP has been damaged. Now, flexor digitorum superficialis helps with the movement of proximal interphalangeal joint of your finger. So there comes this picture. This is your flexor digitorum superficialis. So that's your tendon. Flexor digitorum superficialis, FDS, helps with this proximal interphalangeal joint flexion. Whereas your flexor digitorum profundus, FDP, it's a mass action muscle and it gives finger flexion in both PIP and DIP joint. Now, the problem is that if a patient has problem with 
proximal interphalangeal joint flexion. Can you say that which tendon has been damaged? Because both FDP and FDS gives PIP joint flexion. Did you guys understand what I am talking about? So FDP supplies both PIP and DIP joint, whereas FDS gives only PIP joint flexion. Now the problem is, if a patient is not able to do PIP joint flexion, it might be injury to the either FDP or FDS. So how to differentiate between these two, that is the important part of your examination. Is this quite understandable, guys? Yes, good. So what we are going to do, we are going to differentiate between this FDS and FDP joint issue. All right, yes, sorry. This is metacarpophalangeal joint. So that's your PIP joint and this is your DIP joint. Sorry for that. Okay, so the PIP joint is, is given by your flexor digitorum superficialis, also flexor digitorum profundus. And this distal interphalangeal joint, this is done by your flexor digitorum profundus only. So because PIP joint is done by both, and if there is, problem with PIP joint flexion, we will not be able to say which tendon has been damaged. To differentiate between that, we do a test. So that test you will have to explain in the exam. So to differentiate between FDP and FDS, we hold down flat all the fingers but one. Let's have a look, have, look at a video because that will be the easiest thing for you to understand. Why should you use mirror? When you draw in a when, when a patient has an injury that may have involved the flexors of the fingers, uh, we need to examine those. Uh, there are two flexors to each finger. One is the FDP, the flexor digitorum profundus, and the other is the FDS, flexor digitorum superficialis. So the first thing to look at is whether they have a normal cascade. So the normal cascade we can see here, when the patient is relaxed, the fingers are flexed at different uh, amounts. If the patient is, for some reason, unable to comply with the full examination, for instance, in a very small child or someone who is... Uh, unconscious, then the, then the thing to do is to squeeze the forearm and you can usually then get gross composite flexion. You move around a little bit, you should then get all four fingers in and you can see whether or not there is continuity of the flexor. Specific examination uh, of them in a patient who is able to comply with you. Um, the, as I say, there are two tendons and we want to examine both the FDP and the FDS. FDP is a mass action muscle in which one muscle has four tendons and flexes all four fingers. So did you guys get it? Like FDP, it's a mass action muscle. And it has, it, one muscle has four tendons, which gives flexion of these fingers. So to examine the FDP of the index finger, I would stabilize the middle phalanx and ask the patient, can you bend down the tip of your finger for me, okay, and press against me. So flexion against resistance of the FDP. That one's easier. The FDS, on the other hand, flexes at the proximal interphalangeal joint, but so does the FDP. So in order to isolate the FDS flexion, we have to uh, handicap the FDP. 
And because it's a mass action muscle, we can do that by holding all the other fingers straight and asking the patient again to bend that finger down. So what you are doing, when you are pressing all other fingers, just allowing one finger to move. So when you are doing that, what you are doing, you are actually restricting the movement or function of FDP. So now if patient is able to flex the joint at the PIP, that means the only tendon which is working now is the FDS because FDP is not active at the moment. Okay, so that's how you differentiate between FDS and FDP joint, FDP tendon, sorry. Now, because the FDP is a mass action muscle and we've held it out in full flexion, when she bends the proximal interphalangeal joint, the only tendon that can be doing that is the FDS. If you bend it down and hold it for me, I can prove that FDP is not having any action there because it is completely slack at the DIP joint. So is this clear, guys, at the moment? So that's how you will need to do it in the exam also. So now that you have done the wrist and finger movement, so wrist, we know the, the flexion of wrist can be affected if there is injury at that site. We know that the finger flexion can be affected because the median nerve and ulnar nerve runs through here. So if you look at here, so this is your ulnar nerve and that's your median nerve. So median nerve and ulnar nerve runs around this area. So if there, is a, if there is a chance that this nerve has been affected, again, the movement of this tendon or muscle can be affected also. If somehow the tendon get damaged, then also the same thing, the finger flexion, wrist flexion can be damaged. So we came to the point of wrist. Now there is thumb movement. Thumb has couple of movements that can be affected. Normally, thumb will have flexion, extension, opposition, abduction, and adduction. So there are five movements of the thumb that we are going to ask the patient to do. So we'll first ask the patient. So now we are going to do some movement of your thumb. So will you please follow my movements? So now, can you please bend your thumb towards your index finger? So bend your thumb towards your, towards your little finger. That's flexion. Now, can you please move your thumb away from your index finger? So that's the index finger, away from index finger. That's extension. Can you please touch your thumb or can you please touch your little finger using your thumb? So when patient touch the little finger using the thumb, that's opposition. And then there are abduction, adduction. So for abduction, you ask the patient, can you please move your thumb towards the ceiling? So moving towards the ceiling, that's abduction. And can you please move your thumb? All right, or can you please touch your index finger using your thumb? When patient touch their index finger using the thumb, that's the time they do the adduction. So this flexion, extension, opposition, abduction, adduction, these are the movement of the thumb joint. So in case of thumb movement, patient can, patient can have a loss of almost every thumb movement except the extension in this case. Because if you look at here, thumb abduction is given by median nerve, thumb adduction given by ulnar nerve, opposition given by median and ulnar nerve, flexion also median and ulnar nerve. Now, so almost everything is affected except the extensor or, or the extension. So in, in case of median or ulnar nerve damage, patient can have loss of thumb flexion, abduction, adduction, and opposition. So these are the important thing that you will need to 
give running commentary in the exam. Let's start the movement again, just to give you a good summary. So you will start with the wrist movement. So ask the patient to do the flexion and extension. In this case, wrist flexion can be affected if flexor carpi radialis or ulnaris is damaged. Then we will do the finger flexion extension, abduction, adduction. Finger flexion can be damaged in here, especially if FDS or FDP is damaged. Abduction, adduction can be also lost if ulnar nerve is damaged, which supplies your interosseous muscle, which actually helps with abduction, adduction. Then we have the five thumb movement. Almost every movement can be affected except the extension. So that's your movement that you will need to do. Once you have done whole movement, if you get FDS, FDP problem, make sure you don't forget to do this test to differentiate between FDP and FDS. So look, feel, move. After movement, then you have, we will also have to check the sensation to rule out nerve injury. So we know that there is median and ulnar nerve which can be damaged in here. So where you're going to check the sensation, using a cotton wool and a pin prick, we are going to check the sensation on some of the areas to look for median and ulnar nerve issues. So if you look at here again, this picture, So median nerve supplies your three and a half finger. So thumb, index finger, middle finger, and half of the lateral finger, half of the ring finger will be given by median nerve. Half of this ring finger and the little finger will be given by ulnar nerve. So to check the sensation, you will be using the cotton wool over the thinner eminence, then the thumb, you can check it on middle finger, little finger, and the hypothenar muscle. So these are the areas where we'll be checking for sensation. So these are the side, thinner, hypothenar, index finger, little finger. Now, anatomical snap box is not necessary in here because radial nerve will be just on the other side, the dorsal aspect of the wrist. So snap box is not very important. If you check at least this four side, it can give you that either median or ulnar nerve or both has been damaged or not. Okay. Now, how to do proper sensory examination? We will discuss it in our neurological exam cages, not today. So we also discussed this in here, how we do the pin prick. So, but not today we are going to discuss it. After sensation, we will finish with checking the power. So to check the power, especially for median nerve and ulnar nerve, we have two specific tests. So for median nerve, we have pen touch test. And for ulnar nerve, we have froment sign or card test. You can also check the power of C8, T1 in this case, because these things can be damaged. Not very important. At least if you do the median nerve and ulnar nerve power test, that should be enough. So how we do the pain touch test? In the pain touch test, you are mainly checking the thumb abduction. So you ask the patient to move the thumb towards the ceiling and touch your pen. If a patient is able to touch the pen by doing this thumb abduction, that means they have enough power. If you also, if you don't have any pen in the exam hall, you can just do a resisted thumb abduction. That means you can just ask the patient to, to press against your hand to, to do the thumb abduction. Whatever it is, if the patient is able to do the thumb abduction and touch the pen like this, that means they have median nerve intact. Let's have a look. Pen with touch the tip of tip of the pen with uh, the tip of his thumb. Nichol is a or touch kar. This is the pen test. Okay, so that's the pen touch test. 
that's for median now. Then there is Froman sign or card test. That's for ulnar nerve. So how we do this card test? So in this case, you will, you will ask the patient to put a paper in between his thumb and index finger, just like this. And you will also do exactly the same. And then you'll try to pull the paper out. If a patient is able to resist that, that means their ulnar nerve is intact. Not like this, we'll do it both at the same time. So what you're doing, you, you gave the patient and asked the patient to put the paper in between thumb and index finger. You will be doing the same, and then you will try to pull it out. Now you can see that this side, the power is lost. Other one that sometimes patient will try their best like not to let you pull it out. In that case, you can see this, the distal phalanx is getting hyperflexed, right? If it gets hyperflexed like this, that's also positive, card test or from inside. All good. So that's your from inside. And let's finish your examination for this wrist cut injury. So to give you a summary, first, you will start with the wipe approach, make sure patient is vitally stable, offer some painkiller, start with the general appearance, then you do the look, palmar aspect and dorsal aspect, then you go to the film, you check the temperature, capillary refilling time and pulse. Then you do the movement, the movement is the trickiest one, so you do the wrist movement, flexion extension, then you do the finger, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. Make sure you don't forget about FDS and FDP difference. Do the thumb movement, all the five movement. Once you have done that, then you do the sensation. And lastly, you do the power for median and then you finish it. Depending on what finding you get, you will have to give the diagnosis. So if you get every other, every injury, you can say that it's a severe, deep knife owned and injuring the flexor tendon of the wrist and hand and also median and ulnar nerve. If you get any vessel problem, you can say injury to the radial artery or ulnar artery. So it depends on what you get in the exam. According to the findings, you will give your diagnosis. This is also your one of the handbook condition 050, so you can also go through it for any other information. And then there is online format explanation. I have written it, everything that we have done. You just need to read it by yourself, okay? Any question, guys? Yes, now that's a good thing, Dr. Artyom. Movement and power can go together. If you, if you want to do that, that's also fine. Yes, Dr. Safa, like movement, it is always tricky for a patient to understand. You can always just show to the patient. When you are showing to the patient, you can just explain. Okay, patient usually understand when you show it. So the, the easiest way to understand what has been damaged, always remember, if a patient is unable to do wrist flexion and finger flexion, that means tendon has been damaged, okay? If a patient's sensation is lost in the median or ulnar nerve territory, nerve is damaged. So that's the easiest way to remember. And then how about the vessel? If capillary refilling time abnormal, pulse is very sluggish, the 
hand feels very cool, that means there is a chance the artery has been damaged. So if, if you remember just this, you will at least get the diagnosis. At least you will be able to say what has been damaged. Not very hard, remember. Any question, guys? Yes, it can be. The handbook case was everything has been damaged. Median nerve, ulnar nerve, median, ar median nerve, ulnar nerve, radial artery, ulnar artery, all the flexors of the wrist, all the flexors of the finger can be damaged. All right, so that brings us to the finishing of our tonight session. Any question, guys? Those who are in Facebook, do you guys have any question? Mm, ulnar pulse, I would not go for ulnar pulse checking, Dr. Uh, Vijan, Vijanta. It's not very easy to get. It's just along the radial artery. So it's not important, so don't go for it. You'll not be able to differentiate that is it a radial or ulnar. Yes, Dr. Vincent, you can do it. In online exam, you can demonstrate the physical exam by moving your hand because you will be able to show this on the video. So yes, you can do it. Not power and tone, Dr. Amit. You can do the finger movement and the power. Like when you ask the patient to do the thumb abduction, patient is just doing an active movement. If you just do a, like if you ask the patient to press against your hand, that means you do a resisted movement, then you are taking the power, okay? We will discuss that, like how to check the power. It will come in our next class, so that that you will understand how to do that, how to do this resisted movement or resisted power check. Yeah, we discuss all the physical examination cases in the class, so it should not be a problem. Whoever asking, I don't know because your name showing as Nokia G twenty one. No need for, we don't need to take the thumb flexor policies longest that much. It's not very important. The doctors make mistake in here is that they don't, they are not able to do it perfectly, especially in the movement part, they get, they get usually the problem because movement is tricky. You will have to comment on what has been lost and you'll have to also use some of these tendons muscle name in the exam. So like, let's say that when patient, when you are asking the patient to do the finger flexion and extension, you will have to comment that will, the patient is unable to do the finger flexion. There is a chance that FD flexor digitorum superficialis or flexor digitorum profundus has been damaged. And at that time, what you will have to do, you'll have to do that FDP, FDS difference. You'll have to explain it. And now, because the finger flexion has been damaged, there is a chance that either FDS or FDP has been damaged or both has been damaged. Okay. If a patient is able to do the finger flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint, that means that likely FDP is, is still there or FDP has not been damaged, okay? 
But still, if you want to differentiate between FDS, FDP injury, you will have to do that test. So that's the, the main complicated part where everyone gets the problem. Apart from that, I don't think it, there should be any issues. You guys just do the movement of the wrist, finger, and the thumb, and just comment on which has been damaged. That's the, that's the only part that you will need to focus on. Other things you already know. If there is a management, Dr. Vincent, yes, you will have to talk about the tetanus vaccine. Without management, no need. Yes, the PowerPoints, the notes will be there for the course students, yes. Now, at least once you should say that it's flexor digitorum superficialis, and after that you can use FDS, FDP. So for those of you who are here, just for physical examination class, yes, that is right that you're, you're going to get the notes and also the notes will be there until you pass the exam and the recordings will be there at least for a month after finishing the class. That means at two months, you will get the recordings just to go through. So that's, that's for our only P course students, all right? The next class will be on Wednesday. So if you, if you still want to join, then make sure you contact with us. You can send an inbox or maybe an email. All the contact thing is given in our first aid AMC clinical. So just contact with us and we can enroll you in. And the good thing is that you can always use this amount for your course also. If you Let's say you've done the physical exam plus, you liked it and you want to do our full course, you can use this $200 just for your full course as well. So you will not need to, you will not need to pay the full course amount in that case. So that's one of the things that we always provide. All right, so that should be the end of tonight's session. We'll, again, we'll start our full physical examination from our next class. So we'll mainly start with the lower limb musculoskeletal exam. We have ankle examination, back pain examination, hip examination. So that will be our main topics in the next class. Thanks all. Have a good night. Bye.